Turn in your Bibles, please, to the book of John, the 15th chapter, page 1136 in your Schofield Reference Bible, and we'll read responsively verses 1 through 4, the text first being verse 4, and then we'll turn to another brief passage of Scripture after we read this. And may we stand together, please. For the reading of God's word, reading responsibly, John 15, verses 1 through 4. I am the true vine, and my father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you, as the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine, no more can ye, except ye abide in me. Turn to the 11th chapter of Matthew, Matthew 11, your Schofield Bible, page 1010. Make that 1011. And we'll read together verses 28 and 29. Matthew 11, verses 28 and 29. Let's read it together, please. Ready? Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. And let's pray. Father, what a joy once again to open our Bibles, to know that we hold within our hands thy very word. Thank you for giving it. Thank you for preserving it. Thank you that we freely possess it tonight. And we're here now to Hear that which you have for us from thy precious word. Grant thy blessing upon this evening, thy power upon our preacher, in Jesus' name. Amen. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you, and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is is light. Our Heavenly Father, bless, I pray, our discussion built around these verses of Scripture tonight, and give us, I pray, something lasting and real that will affect us and change us. In Jesus' name, amen. When you were without Christ, he invited you to come to him. And that's all you have to do, is come to him. You don't have to come to him with a new leaf turned over. You don't have to come to him with a baptismal robe dripping wet. You don't have to come to him with the taste of the sacrament in your lip and in your mouth. You don't have to come to him with your hands dripping with good works. You just come to him. The Bible says over and over and over again, Let him that is a thirst, let him come and take with the water of life freely. As I have so often said, Mr. Spurgeon used to say, uh, If you're not saved, Run to Jesus and be saved. He said, if you can't run, then walk. If you can't walk, then crawl. If you can't crawl, then look. For there's life for a look at the Savior. Jesus said, as Moses had lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believeth on him should not perish but have eternal life. Now what God is saying there, salvation is just as easy as... Um, as uh, uh, when the Israelites were bitten by the, by the fiery serpents, were told by, by Moses to look to the brazen serpent. God said to Moses, Moses, take a piece of brass and beat that piece of brass into a, a, where it looks like a serpent and hold that serpent high and tell every Jew that has been bitten by the fiery, de- deadly, venomous serpents to look and they live. I'm sure some uh, deeper lifers said that's easy believism. All you've got to do is just look and live. 
Uh, that's easy to leave this one. That's plucking green fruit. That crowd's still around today, the do-nothing crowd, that criticize the do-something crowd. And uh, they're still around today. Yes, call it what you want to call it. But all you've got to do to get saved is come to Jesus. That's all you've got to do to get saved. And that's all they had to do in Moses' day was look. Didn't have to look and hang on and be tested for six months. Didn't have to look and hold out faithful. Didn't have to look and get baptized. Didn't have to look and take communion. Didn't have to look and live a good life. Didn't have to look and hold out faithful. Didn't have to look and take the sacrament. Didn't have to look and take the Holy Eucharist. Didn't have to look and get confirmed. Didn't have to look and join the church. All you had to do was look. That's all. That's all they had to do. That's all they could do was look because they're dying. Uh, you, uh, that thief on the cross, all he did was just look over to Jesus and say, in fact, he didn't even word it too well. He said, remember me, you're not coming into thy kingdom. He was over a thousand years too soon. And he didn't understand it all, but Jesus knew what he meant. Uh, but thief, you've got to join the church. I can't join the church. I'm dying and I need Jesus. But thief, you've got to get baptized. I can't get baptized. I'm stuck in the cross here. I'm dying and I need Jesus. Well, then you better live a good life. What have I got? To, I haven't got any life left. My life is gone. I'm dying. I need Jesus. Well, you got, you got to take the Holy Eucharist. Holy cow. I haven't got time to take the Holy Eucharist. I'm dying. And I need Jesus. And, and you're dying and you need Jesus too. And so you came. That's the only way you get saved. Oh, you say, I don't understand. How does it just seem so simple? Thank God he made it simple. Thank God he made it simple. Somebody said, Brother Howard, you make salvation so easy. I didn't make it all. God made it. I just proclaim it. That's all. But I get a little sick and tired of these people that I call a Baptist Arminian crowd. Baptist works crowd. You've got to accept Him as Lord as well as Savior. That's a bunch of garbage. That's not in the Bible at all. You accept Him as Lord to be a Christian. You accept Him as uh, Savior to be a Christian. You accept Him as Lord to be a good Christian. But to get to heaven, you take Him as the Savior the Lamb of God who taketh away the sins of the world. And Jesus said, just come. That's all you got to do is come. Now, wait a minute. Now that you've come, he gives another invitation for you, and that invitation is for you to stay. He, come, he, he says, in fact, we read a while ago, he says, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. What does that mean? He's talking about, I'll give you rest to your spirit. You, you, you won't have to try to work your way to heaven. You can know you're saved. But now he said, now that you've come, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. For I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls. Now, if we, if we went to our text in John, we will not. If we went to our text in John, we had uh, find Jesus saying, abide in me. And that's what he's saying here. He says to all who, co- to, who have not come to him, he says, come to me. And then he says to those who have come to him, abide in me. What he's saying there is come and stay. Now, he invites you to stay. There, I don't mean stay in salvation now, because once you get saved, that settles it. It's done. The great transaction's done. I am my Lord's and he is mine. But once you come to Christ and for salvation, God wants you to stay. He says, come unto me. And then he says, abide in me. Notice, come to me, but abide in me. He says, come. He says, come. Uh, you come to me? Okay, you're saved now. But he says, come on in and live here. You can live inside here if you want to, and abide in me, he says, while you're here. Now, he uses every motive to get you to stay that he used to get you to come. Every motive. What motive brought you to Christ? Was it deliverance from sin? Were you sick and tired of sin? Were you sick and tired of the misery it brought? Were you sick and tired of the bondage that, under which it held you? Were you sick and tired of sin and you said, This is not for me. I'm tired of sin. I want forgiveness. I want deliverance. Was it the fact that you were bound by the bottle? Was it the fact that you were bound by lust? Was it the fact that you were bound by narcotics? Was it the fact that you were bound by lying or stealing or dope? What was it? Were you bound? And you said, I want to get unbound from this. I'm not happy. And nobody's happy who's in sin. Nobody's happy. There's no peace, saith my God, the wicked. Was that what brought you to Christ? Okay, then Jesus says, all right. Come unto me, all you that labor and heavy laden. I'll give you rest. Him that cometh to me, I would in no wise cast out. Let uh, whosoever will, let him come and take of the water of life freely. Then he says, come, and I'll unbind you from your sin. But then he says to those who have come to Christ, he says, you come now and abide with me, and I'll deliver you even more from sin. Uh, are you using the same 
uh, motive that he used to get you to come to him, he uses to get you to stay when you come. What brought you to Christ? What motive brought you to Christ? Was it a desire for peace and joy? Did you long for sweet peace and for faith to increase and it earnestly, fervently prayed? You can only be blessed and find peace and sweet rest when all on the altar is laid. Was it a hunger for peace? Had you sought everything else and there was an emptiness inside? And somebody stood up one day and said, Thank God I came to Jesus and He gave me peace and I have the peace of God in my soul. I have the joy, 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 joy down in my heart, but I have the peace that passeth understanding down in my heart. Was it the peace of God and the joy? Did you see some Christian people and say, I wish I had the joy they seem to have? Did you see some Christian people and say, I'd like to know the peace that they seem to have? And you came, and uh, you've longed for sweet peace, and you came to Christ, and God gave you peace. Now he comes to you who have come to him and says, Abide in me. I've got more peace than that. I'll give you more peace. If you live in me, come, I'll give you peace. Stay, <coughs> I'll give you more peace, he said. What brought you to Christ? What was the motive that brought you to the Savior? Was it a desire to know the true and the living God? What brought you to Christ? Was it a desire for heaven? Jesus says, come to me. <laughs> now, I'll give you a home in heaven. But he says, abide with me, and I'll bring a little heaven down here early and see what it's going to be like. And uh, uh, blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heaven came down and glory filled my soul. Here have we no continuing city, but we <laughs> seek one to come. And God said, come to me, and someday you can go to heaven. He said, stay and abide with me and abide in me, and I'll bring heaven to you and uh, let you have a little foretaste of heaven while you're here on this earth. Um, what was it? Now then Jesus says, you can have some more of it. If you came to get uh, forgiveness of sin, stay, and you'll get more forgiveness of sin. <laughs> you came to get peace, stay, you'll get more peace. If you came to get joy, stay, you'll get more joy. If you came to get forgiveness, stay, <laughs> you'll get more forgiveness. If you came to honor the true and the living God, stay. You'll know Him better if you stay. What He's saying is, abide in Me. Now, what is the difference between the come unto Me and abide in Me? The difference is, I think, fourfold. First, when you come, He gives you His love. But when you abide, when you pardon me, you abide, His love flows through you. Now, let me say, explain what that means. When you you came to Christ, God imparted His love to you, and you get that by coming. You get the love of Christ imparted to you by coming. But when you abide, His love flows through you like a conduit. The line, the electric wires in this building, they go through a conduit, and the conduit causes the power to pass through. And Jesus said, you come to me, and I'll give you uh, my love. But if you abide with me, I'll let my love flow through you, and others can get my love through you. You can be a conduit. Jesus says, you come to me, and you can have my wisdom. But he said, you stay and abide with me. And he said, I'll let my wisdom flow through you. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that if you come to Christ, he gives you his love. But if you abide in him, I'm talking about if that's where you live. You don't just come to church on Sunday and sing the Lord is in his holy temple, but you love him all week long and you walk with him. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I'm his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none others ever known. He says, I want you to live here. I want you to abide with me. Uh, when you got married, you got engaged. You said, would you be mine? Oh, she said, well, I've been working on this for a long time. You didn't know it, but I've been reeling you in for a long, long time. And uh, finally she said, yes. And then when the marriage day came, and uh, she came to live and abide with you, and the Lord Jesus said, I wish you'd come and live with me. I want you to live in me. I want, to abide. I want you to abide in me. Make me your dwelling place. He says, come unto me, and I'll give you wisdom. But he says, if you will abide in me, I'll make you a carrier of my wisdom. And he says, I'll let my wisdom flow through you. Oh, you'd be amazed if you knew all that God has for you. There's so much more God has than what we take. We come to get joy, and God said, I'll give you joy. But if you'll stay here, I'll let my joy flow through you. 
We come to get wisdom, and God said, I'll give you wisdom, but if you'll live in me and abide in me, I'll let my wisdom flow through you. We come to get power, and God said, "If you'll, that's okay, I'll give you power, but if you'll abide in me, I'll let my power throw you through you. God said, I want to I want to put you and work with business with me. Let you become a conduit. I will bless people, and that blessing will go from me through you to them. And I'll let you be a conduit where my wisdom may flow through you, and my power may flow through through you, and my joy may flow through you, and my love may flow through you. And that's the only chance this whole sinful world's got to see the love of Christ, is if you and I abide. Oh, listen to me. <coughs> All this kind of Christianity comes just to get what Jesus has. Come and, and I, I'm saved. Well, how's that? Can, can I, uh, but I'd go to hell if I did that. Well, you might not go to hell if you did that, but somebody else might if you did it. I'm saying God wants more than just a Sunday morning Christianity. God wants more than just a living room to live in. God wants more than just a vestibule. God wants all of you. Dr. Rice used to say God wants the money in the billfold, and God wants the billfold the money is in, and God wants the pants the billfold's in. God wants the man the pants are on. And God wants all of it. And God comes and says tonight, Come! <laughs> I'll give you, I'll give you a wisdom. But he said, If you'll stay, I'll, let you, I'll go in partners with you. I'll let you be in business with me. And I'll use you as a, as a, as a conduit whereby my wisdom can flow through you. I, for 40 years nearly, I've been a preacher. And for 38 of those years, I've been a pastor. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful thing. I'd rather be a preacher than be anything in the whole world. But the great thing about it is, thanks be to God, I, I believe in some small way, and I, I've thought about it so much this week in lieu of what I said this morning, I believe in some small way God has done more than give His love to me. I think that in some small way God has let me carry His love so that I can be a conduit to say, Oh, sinful world, let me show you what the love of Christ is like. Let me show you. I do not believe I'm the wisest man that ever lived, but I think that God in His mercy has given me ability through these years, or the privilege through these years. I think God has given me the privilege of being a conduit to carry some of His wisdom. See, God, <coughs> God doesn't want you to say, Here's a bucket of wisdom. Take it and spread it. No, God said, Hang on to me and I'll pour my wisdom through you, and I'll pour it out to others through you. God didn't say, here's a bucket of love. <laughs> here's a bucket of love. Take, and that's what he does when you get saved. Here's a bucket of love. Take it and throw it out. God said, I can beat that. He says, why don't you live here? Why don't you make me your whole life? Use it for the house. Isn't that sort of fanatical? You're getting the idea. That's exactly what I have in mind. Well, for the house. <laughs> you think I might not be called a religious fanatic? Yep, you're getting the idea. That's exactly what I have in mind. And if you're not called religious fanatic in this pagan old world, you're not much Christian, I'll guarantee you. God says, I want you to live. He says, I, I enjoy it when you come and read my book, but He said, won't you live there? He said, I enjoy it when you come to pray, but why don't you live there? He said, I enjoy it when you come and fellowship with me, but why don't you live there? I enjoy it when you tell me you love me, but why don't you live there? The Savior says, I enjoyed your coming, and I've given you eternal life. Now, why don't you stay? There's a second difference in this matter of coming and staying, and that second difference is this. Coming brings rest, but staying or abiding brings rest to your soul. Let me read to you again. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. But now, wait a minute. Take my yoke upon you. Hang around. <coughs> Learn of me, for I am meek and lowly and heart, and ye shall find rest unto your soul. <laughs> what does it mean? It means this. It means when you come to Christ... He gives you the rest that, that salvation is. No longer are you working or laboring to get yourself saved. You come and you rely on Jesus to save you, and Hebrews calls that a perfect rest. But now there's a more, another rest that God wants to give you. He said, if you'll stay, I'll give you rest to your soul. Let me tell you what that means. You, you know you're saved. You put your trust and your faith in Christ. It's all settled and you're saved. But... Uh, and you found rest there as far as your spirit's concerned. But there's turmoil remaining in your soul. You know what I'm talking about. No peace in your soul. Oh, sure. You know you're saved. You died, you'd go to heaven. And you have that much peace. But God says you don't have to have a fretful soul if you'll live in me. You don't have to worry and fret and stew and, and fuss.
fuss and fume and be upset with each other and gossip and criticize and be mad and <coughs> divisive and unkind and hurtful. God said, won't you live here and listen? I don't understand it. Why don't we get as excited about what we believe as, as, as the dirty terrorists do about their garbage? And, I mean, they're more excited about that than we are about Jesus. I'm simply saying God said, live here. He said, come. And you came. <laughs> he said, that's not all I want. I want you to live here. And he says, I'll give rest to your soul. Let me, let me explain that, what I mean. Once you've tasted, once you've tasted this, brother, everything else going to be garbage after that. You may come to Christ and go back in the world, but you'll never be happy back in the world again. You're ruined, you're ruined for the world. Uh, the truth is, the happiest person is the person that's saved and in the will of God and abiding in Christ. Second happiest person is the person that's unsaved. Third happiest person is the person that's saved and not living in the will of God. Why? Because the Holy Spirit came in you to live when you got saved. <coughs> and, and, brother, <coughs> when you come to Christ and the Holy Spirit comes in you to live, then from then on, you've got somebody with you where you go. Anybody here ever, ever go to taverns around town? Anybody here ever go to a tavern around this area? Buddy? Oh, you're wonderful Christian people. I know some of you guys up here have been to taverns. This is the sinful crowd up here. Yeah, who, 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 uh, anybody know of a tavern here in the town, in the area? Somebody help me. I, this whole sermon is going to be ruined if I don't have some help right now. Elaine, have you ever been to a tavern town? <laughs> Remember that song? There is a tavern in the town. Who back there? Good. What's the name of that tavern? What's the name of one of them? <coughs> what's, the, what's the name of one of them? Na give me the name of one real loud. Grapevine? Grapevine. You used to hang out the grapevine. How long have you been saved? A year and eight months. Been the grapevine since then? Over to get, get them saved. <coughs> Well, let's suppose, let's suppose that tonight after the service you said, I, uh, I'm going to go to the grapevine again. I, I, I just, it's not the vine I want, not the grape I want. It's what came from the vine by way of the grape. And <coughs> so I'm going to go to the grapevine, and I'm going to go back over there. <coughs> I'm going to do it. And suppose you drive up, and, uh, and, and, and you drive and walk in, and I'm standing at the door. And there you are. You just got through ordering uh, some roast and air punch. Uh, you may call it corn liquor. And uh, <coughs> you got through ordering some. And, 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 and there I am in the grave. Now ask the question. You Boy, they, they serve that, <coughs> that stuff to you. <coughs> and you look over there, and there's Brother Howes. You going to enjoy it? No, you're not going to enjoy it. Because Brother Howes is going to be there. Um, I mean, if Brother Howes were there. By the way, if I were there, I'm there passing out tracks, of course, as you know. <laughs> But, but, John, where is that grapevine located? <laughs> Over on Torrance Street. And, uh, but, oh, you wouldn't enjoy it. You wouldn't enjoy it at all. <laughs> because where the house is there. I want to tell you something, folks. When you come to Christ, the Holy Spirit comes in to live. And every time you go to some place you couldn't go, He's there. And He's going to tap you on the shoulder and say, You shouldn't be here. There's no place for you to be. You know, if there's anything which I long in this church, I say it often, I long for our people to be spiritual. I long for you to do more than just come to church and read a few scriptures before you go to bed at night and say your prayer, grace at the table, little prayer before you go to bed at night. I long for you to abide in Christ. And Jesus comes and says, Come to me. Come to me. I'll give you rest. But he said, Come and stay, and I'll let you, I'll, I'll let rest, give rest to your soul. What does that mean? It means not just rest to your spirit to know you're saved, but I'll give you rest to your soul. I'll give you a right relationship between yourself and other people. <laughs> I'll give you uh, rest to that, that uh, that lives in the world. I'll give you rest to your soul. He said, if you'll come to me, you've tasted once you've tasted the grapes and pomegranates of the promised land, and once you've come back with the grapes of Eskel, you'll never be satisfied with the onions and watermelon and cucumbers and garlic of Egypt again. <coughs> and God said, <coughs> He said, Come unto me, and I'll give you peace. But said, You come and, and stay. I'll let you be a, a conduit of peace. Come unto me. I'll give you joy. 
But he said, you stay. I'll make you a conduit of joy. <laughs> Come to me. I'll give you wisdom. But he said, if you'll stay, I'll make you a conduit of wisdom. And he said, Come unto me, and I'll, uh, I'll uh, give you rest, not only to your spirit, but I'll give you rest to your soul. I was on an airplane going to Alaska, of all things, and uh, sat down beside a fellow, and he made a mistake. Uh, he ordered a martini. I mean, I don't know what it was, Bloody Mary, uh, Wounded Susie. I'm not sure what it was, but it was a, it was a, it was a, a corker, and uh, the real McCoy, and I was sitting beside him. And so, <laughs> after a while, <laughs> he sa I said, uh, how are you today? I hadn't spoken to him yet until after he ordered the Bloody Mary. And uh, he sa I said, how are you today? He said, fine. I said, don't you look familiar to me? He said, are you Dr. Jack Hiles? And I said, yes. I said, aren't you? Uh... He said, yes. I... <laughs> I said, haven't I seen you in Alaska before? Oh, yes, yes. I said, aren't you a deacon in a church there? Yeah. He didn't know I saw him order. He tried to get that stewardess's attention. Oh, he tried to... <laughs> she didn't know what he was talking about. You know why? Because Dr. Hiles was sitting beside him. And I knew his pastor, too. And he knew I knew his pastor. And I'd seen him, too. And he was sitting there. And pretty soon, <coughs> that martini came. <coughs> and he said, oh, this is by mistake. She said, oh, no. She said, I've got it right here on the card. She says, <laughs> <laughs> and I looked over and I said, those seven ups are pretty good, aren't they? <laughs> I didn't know they put olives and cherries and seven ups. And, uh, <laughs> and uh, now he, uh, he drank it, but he didn't enjoy it. And neither will you. You were ruined. Because in your body <coughs> dwells the Holy Spirit of God, and once He comes to dwell, <coughs> you're ruined. And God said, away with this half in, half out, half on, half off, half hot, half cold, milk and cider kind of Christianity. He said, all to Jesus I surrender, all to Him I freely give. I will ever love and trust Him in His presence daily live. You see, He says, come to me and I'll, <coughs> and I'll give you rest. But he said, come and take my yoke upon you and abide and live here. And he said, I'll give you rest to your soul. There's a third reason. That uh, a third difference. One is come is given and abide is found. He said, um, come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Then he said, take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and you shall, fi you shall find rest unto your souls. You see, coming is, and God gives you that rest, but when you abide and get the extra rest, that rest is given because you find it yourself. The rest that God gives you in response to your coming to Him is a gift, but the rest that you get in response to your abiding is earned. He says you earn this kind of rest. Uh, you know the Bible to get saved. You read it to get rest to your soul. You know, you know just enough Scripture to get saved. You know Romans 3.10, 3.23. You may not even know that, but you know you're a sinner and that Christ loved you and died for sinners and paid the penalty for sinners, and that'll get you, that'll get you to Christ. But to get you this second rest and to get you this abiding in Christ, then you've got to live in the, in the Word of God. You've got to know it and live in it. I'm grieved. I, I feel that most of our people spend more time watching TV than they spend what, reading the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. How about you? I'm grieved that many of our ladies watch the dirty soap operas in the afternoons that are sorry as the devil that spawned them and the hell that performed them, and, uh, and yet the Word of God goes unread. I was thinking this morning while Brother Dan was singing, Oh, the land of the unplowed day, Oh, the land that plowed this day. I was thinking of my mother. One of her three or four favorite songs, the last song we sang together, was we sang, joined hands and we sang as best we could. 
Oh, the land of the cloudless day. Oh, the land of the unclouded day. And I thought of Mother and I thought of her Bible. I have it in my office, tear-stained, marked, used. I thought of her Bible. I thought of the times Mama prayed on her knees. And I thought, how Mama lived in Christ, and how he was everything. When I was a boy, it was Jesus for breakfast, and Jesus for lunch, and Jesus for supper. We didn't go meet God at church. He, we had God at home. We read the Bible more at home than at church. And I can remember that night, I've shared it with you on occasion through the years, when I was 17 years of age. And a, a, a wicked girl decided she was going to try to ruin me. I'd never been out past 11 o'clock. And wicked, two, three wicked boys and, and, and th- uh, two wicked boys and three wicked girls, they talked me into a blind date. And I, I was in the wrong crowd the first time I'd ever been in the wrong crowd in my life. And uh, that night we drove to the Texas Theater. We were just outside the Texas Theater, the very theater where Lee Harvey Oswald, uh, supposedly, I guess, the alleged killer of President Kennedy, where he was captured in the Texas Theater on Jeffer- West Jefferson Street in Dallas. And the six of us were sitting in the car at 1 o'clock. I'd never been in past 11 o'clock. had never been in past 11 all my life. And uh, I, uh, at 1 o'clock in the morning, they opened a bottle of whiskey, and the driver took from it and gave it to the day, his date beside him in the front seat, and she drank and gave it to the young man beside her in the front seat. He drank and passed it back in the back seat to the, his date behind him, and she drank, and she passed it to my date, and I drank. And my date drank from it. I'm sorry, my date drank, and I didn't drink, but I, I, uh, she drank, and she passed it to me. And for the first time in my life, I held a whiskey bottle in my hand. And I didn't want to be different. And that's why you shouldn't run with the wrong crowd. You shouldn't run with any crowd where you've got to be, be different to be right and be good. And I, t- I held it in my hands for the first time in my life. And I didn't want to be different. And they all ten of those eyes were, get, were fastened right on me. That's what they had in mind that night. They were going to make Jackie Boy Hiles take his first drink. And they were going to make him sell his soul. And all of a sudden I took that and raised it to my lips. And I got it within an, in an inch of my lips. And all of a sudden I felt like I'd been stuck with a da- dagger or a knife or had a heart attack. And a, a pain pierced my chest. And I, b- mainly because I was hurting, but also because I wasn't going to drink it, I threw that bottle up in the air and whiskey spilled all over the car. Everybody except me. And uh, got soaking wet with that whiskey. And I said, take me home. Take me home. And the, uh, the driver said, did little Lord Flauntroy want a knit or crochet or embroidered? And I said, never mind, just take me home. And they drove me home. When I got to our little place where we lived, there was a wood stove in the place. It was not burning because it was summertime, but there was a wood stove. And I walked up to the front door, and the screen was all that was closed. The main door was open. And I looked at about 1.20 in the morning, and my little mother in a drawstring nightgown and a drawstring nightcap was kneeling at the, at, at, at the, made an altar out of the wood stove. And I stopped and listened, and I heard her, and she said, Oh, God, take care of my, my boy, and don't let him do anything wrong. Oh, God, I've had to be a mother and a father both to him, and I've tried the best I can. Oh, God, take care of him and keep him clean, and don't let him do anything wrong. And I said, Mama. And my little mother looked, and she jumped across the room and landed in my arms like that, and I held her like that. And Mama said, son, you didn't do nothing wrong, did you? You didn't do nothing wrong, did you, son? Did you, did you, did you? And I said, no, Mama. But I said at 1 o'clock in the morning, a bottle of whiskey was one inch from my lip. Did you, you didn't drink it, did you, son? No, Mama, I didn't. I said exactly at 1 o'clock, a pain shot through my chest. I thought I'd had a heart attack or been stuck with a dagger, and I dropped it <coughs> and spilled it. And my Mama clapped her hands, and she said, praise the Lord. She said, it's exactly 1 o'clock when I knelt here to pray. My mama lived there. She didn't come to visit Jesus. She lived there. And I saw it. I thank God that I've seen a taste of real Christianity. 
I thank God that I grew up at the knees of a godly woman who not only came to Jesus, but she stayed when she came. And God said, I've got so much for you. I want you to have rest. But he said, if you'll stay, I'll give you rest to your soul. God said, I've got so much more for you than just coming. Why don't you stay when you come? Why don't you decide to be a fanatic? Why don't some of you people that have come, if you've come to Jesus, won't you decide to act like it and dress like it and talk like it and sing like it and, and look like it and wear your hair like it and, <coughs> and look like it? Why don't you decide? Jesus said, come, I'll give you a home in heaven. He said, stay, I'll give you a heaven on earth. I count it a privilege here, his cross to bear. If Jesus goes with me, I'll go anywhere. That's what he says. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. My yoke is easy and my burden is light. He says, if you'll come to me, I'll give you, you, find, you, give you rest. If you abide in me, you can find rest to your souls. You uh, don't need to work to get saved, but you need to work to get rest to your soul. Jesus says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. I hadn't thought of this in a long time. My daddy didn't care much for me. My daddy got bitter because of the depression. And my daddy was never real proud of me. I was a little bitty boy. Daddy was a big man. Great big giant of a fellow, strongest man I ever met. I've seen my Uncle Roy take a baseball bat. I've seen my daddy brace himself just like this. And Uncle Roy swing that baseball bat. I would, if you told me this, I'd think you were lying. And if you think I'm lying, I don't care. We don't blame you a bit. But if not, I've seen it happen. And my sister, she'll, she'll, she'll bear this lie out. And, uh, but uh, I've seen Uncle Roy take a baseball bat. My daddy hold himself. Uncle Roy take that bat and swing as hard as he could. Hit my dad in the stomach, knock him, not, not even knock him out of his tracks. Let me show you, Brother John. Swing just as hard as he could. And... Uh, Better still, you show, let me show him. But, but my, my daddy never was real proud of me because I wasn't big. I was always little. They called me a little Jackie boy, and I was nervous. And, but uh, when, I got, uh, when I became a paratrooper <laughs> in World War II, my dad sort of took notice then. He didn't think I could pass the physical. And, uh, and if I did, he didn't think I could do all the stuff I had to do. And then the dead sure didn't think I could jump out of an airplane. But... Uh, I had the courage to get pushed out 19 times, but I, uh, I, uh, I remember when I got back, I got out of the army. I went home, couldn't find work, and uh, my daddy started proud of me because of the paratrooper, but I couldn't find any work, and I tried so hard to find a job, I couldn't. And I went to my dad, and I said, Dad, you reckon there's any place I can find a job? And my dad, who did not live at home, he said, Son, he said, if you want to learn, learn how to lay oak floor and hang, hang drywall, we called it sheetrock in those days, you can work for me and with me. And I tell you, boy, I learned how to hang drywall. In those days, you had to use, a, use nails, a little, a little shingle nail-like thing, and you had to hold that thing on your head there and, and hold it up on the ceiling. And, and laid, laid oak floor with, with a hammer or a rig axe and, and, and bent like that a little bit and plain old case and nails and sometimes uh, ring shank nails. And I got, I, for months and months, I laid oak floor. And I got to where I could lay more oak floor than my daddy could. In fact, I could lay more oak floor than anybody in our county could. And uh, my daddy was so proud of me. And he'd brag on me. He'd say, this is my son. He can lay more oak floor than I can. I've been laying, laying oak floor all these years. And my daddy was proud of me. And my daddy and I worked together. You know, my Savior says, I'd like to have you work with me. I'd like to have you. I'd like for it to be Jesus and sons. I'd like to have you in business with me. He said, I want you to join. And God, in his wonderful mercy, has said, you can do my work with me. And we, he says, uh, Paul said, we are laborers together with God. Did you hear that? We're laborers together with God. We're in the same business. And the Father, up in heaven, in heaven, the Father looks down and hears me preaching tonight, and he says, that's my boy. We're in the same business. It's, it's God and Son. We're in the same business together, and, and, uh, and God is proud of me. That is not all. <coughs> um, 
my father-in-law, I, uh, I tried to win him to Christ, and I couldn't. And I tried, and I couldn't. And I tried, and I couldn't. But when I became an oak floor layer, I used to meet him at his feed store, and he'd drive me back, back home <coughs> in his car, and he'd see me with those blisters on my hands and those calluses on my hands. He didn't care much for me either. Nobody ever cared for me at first, but to know me is to love me. And <coughs> so <coughs> he'd see me, and, you know, he got, he got confidence in me. And I remember for 17 years I prayed that I went into Christ. Never got him to even care much about me till he saw me work hard. And one day I was, one day I was that back in Texas preaching. <coughs> it was on his <coughs> 70th birthday. And uh, I decided to go win him to Christ. I went to see him. I walked in and I said, Papa, I won't tell you how to be saved. He always said the same thing. Haven't got, haven't got time for that. Haven't got time for that. Don't care for preachers. Haven't got time for that. And I said, Papa, <coughs> you're 70 years old today. You're going to take time for it. No, I haven't got time for that. I haven't got time. He was always nice, and he liked me after I laid oak floor and worked my fool head off and, and blistered my whole hand all the way through and got cancer of the palm and everything. But, <coughs> but uh, I haven't got but talk to him about Jim. I haven't got time for that. And I said, Papa, you're going to take time. I said, I am going to tell you how to be saved, either in your living room here, you and me, or I am going to buy a loudspeaker and put it on the top of my car, and I'm going out in the front at 2830 Harlandale in the front, and I'm going to say, Mr. Slaughter, this is your son-in-law. Do you know that Romans 3.10 says, as it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one? And Romans 3.23, and I said, either you listen to me now like a, little, a good little boy, or I'm going to go out there in the middle of the street and broadcast it because you're going to hear how to be saved today. Now take your choice. He said, go ahead. And I, I sat there and told him about Jesus. And I began to pray. And when I prayed, he began to pray. And he started off by saying, I thank God I have a son-in-law whom I can trust. And that afternoon, he was sweetly saved. And that I called Bob Keyes over at Galilean Baptist Church, his pastor. I said, Bob, can I use your baptistry tonight? He said, what for? <clears throat> I said, I want to baptize my father-in-law on his 70th birthday. And that night, nine of us gathered. I preached over in, in the other side of the county and then drove over there at 11 o'clock at night. Nine of us went in there, and, uh, and, and uh, we, we sang, On Jordan stormy banks I stand and cast a wistful eye to Canaan's fair and happy land where my possessions lie. And then we sang, Shall we gather through about 11, 11, 15 at night? And, uh, and then when Papa got baptized, as the Lord him in the water. Everybody started singing, Happy birthday to you, happy birthday. You know the rest of it, don't you? And uh, started singing it like that. And as he got a... You don't understand uh, my father-in-law. He was a brusque man, a good man, an honest man. A guy that would always pay the bill. Nobody got to pay the bill around him. He paid the bill. He was a... He was the old, the old school kind of fellow, 37 years, owned a feed store, never took a vacation, always worked day and night, and... Uh, you understand it? He wasn't this kind of fella. But as he got out of the water, they were singing happy birthday. He looked over and he said, Son, I had two birthdays the same day, didn't I? Two birthdays the same day. You say, what, what all caused that? Because I got to work with my daddy. I believe if I hadn't, if, I, if I'd known that daddy would live long enough, I could have gotten to win him too. But I didn't know he was going to go. But I got to work with him, and Daddy was so proud of me before he died. And because I worked with my Daddy, and because I worked hard, my father-in-law got saved. What am I saying? I'm saying tonight, God says, I want you as my child. But he said, now you get that by coming to me. But he said, if you'll stay, we can go in business together. You can work with me. You can be a coal laborer with me. Why don't you abide with me? He said. Now I say this in closing. There's a there's another difference in coming and abiding. Coming, he gives you his love. When you abide, his love flows flow, flow through you. Coming, he gives you his wisdom. When you abide, his wisdom flows through you. Coming, he gives you his joy. When you abide, his joy flows through you. Coming, 
He gives you His power. When you abide, His power flows through you. Coming, He gives you His forgiveness. When you abide, His forgiveness flows through you. But there's a second difference, and that is coming brings rest, but abiding brings rest to your soul. There's a third difference, and that is coming is given, abiding is found. Coming is a gift, abiding is earned. But fourth and quickly, lastly, abiding makes God's purpose for you fulfilled. Now, please listen, and I'll be through. Coming to Christ, hear me now. Coming to Christ gives you what Christ died for you to have. Abiding in Christ gives God what Christ died for Him to have. Are you telling me that you're going to sit there and be satisfied with coming for salvation just so you can get the reason the, what Christ died for you to have? Let me tell you something, Buster. Christ died before Christ ever died for you. Christ died for God. Christ died. There was a, there was a holy and just God. And, and, and you sinned against Him. And God said, I can't take Him back because I'm just. But I love Him. And I want Him back. I'd like to have Him back, but I can't because I'm just. And Jesus came and said, Father... If I went down to heaven and took upon myself the likeness of sinful flesh and lived and died on the cross and went to suffer the pangs of hell, would that satisfy your justice? And God the Father said, that's all it would. Jesus said, okay, I'll do it. Now listen, Jesus didn't come mainly and first and foremost. Jesus didn't come to say, to get to die on the cross to save you, to get you to heaven so you could enjoy heaven. Him and out. He came and died on the cross to get you to heaven so God could enjoy you. Forgive me, but it's a pretty sorry kind of Christianity who comes to Christ and all you ever do is fulfill the purpose of Calvary for his own enjoyment. But there's a God in heaven that made you to serve him and praise him. There's a God in heaven that made man so man could exalt him and worship him and honor him and glorify him. Now, you'll forgive me for saying this, and I'm not boasting at all, but let me tell you something. And God knows I'm telling you the truth if I ever know and I put my hand on his book. He gets some for me that he made me for. I mean, brother, I praise him. I do. I get sometimes up on a bed in the motel room and I just tell him how great he is. That's what he made me for. He said, if you'll come to me, I'll give you what Jesus died for you to have. But if you'll stay, I'll give God what Jesus died for him to have. He loves you. He wants you. And he made you for himself. And he wants you to love him. Listen, he loves to be loved. He wants you to love him. He wants you to praise him. He wants you to worship him. But you can't do that unless you abide in him. And that's why he comes and he says, Come to me. I'll give you rest. <laughs> he said, If you'll stay here, we'll both have fun. Come to me. <laughs> I'll give you what I died to give you. You'll stay here. I'll get what I died, what Jesus died to get me. Are you going to live your life and God never get from you what he saved you for? How long has it been? How long has it been since you looked up to God and said, I love you, I love you, I love you, I praise you, I adore you, and you're my God and you're my Savior, and I love you with all my heart. How long has it been? Back this other night, one night about ten minutes after twelve, she called and I picked up the phone. And I said, well, hello. That's what I used to say. Yeah. And uh, it's a good thing to say. And I said, hello. And Becky said, Dad. I said, Becky, is everything all right? And she said, oh, yeah. I said, what's wrong, Becky? She said, I had to hear your voice. I said, fine. 
I know I have a wonderful voice. I know what I'm supposed to talk to him. I said, he said that here. He said that. Uh, the children have been back today. And she said, you always seem to know how to handle us when we're bad. And she said, I, I've been a mother all day. And she said, I just need to be a little girl so you can know, hear your voice. I'm Dr. Jack Howard. Before he hears, I've been preaching. I've pastored more people than anybody's ever pastored in the history of this nation. I've baptized, I've said to baptized more converts than any church ever baptized. But that's not the big reason why God saved me. God wants me to come to him and say, Now please, don't you just be in this now. God, this Jack, this is Jack. <laughs> he hell is lucky, boy. You know what I miss about Mama being gone the most? Yeah. I miss somebody nagging at me because I don't have a hat on and it's cold outside. I miss Mama saying, Son, you don't look sexy enough. She wouldn't say that now, but... but <laughs> Son, are you? <laughs> God, yes, sir. And I... Uh, sometimes I just want to come to Jesus. Now, let's say Jesus is that time. <laughs> you know, maybe. <laughs> I'm a pastor of this. No, it's a guy. And uh, I see the burden of being a pastor. They never had to do it. It's summertime and the apple is down a little bit. And uh, he was just, uh, just felt like I needed to call you. Just need to hear your voice. Don't get it to pass the first study to God over 40 years. And time seemed for him to die, he had a stroke. He was just about dead. And, uh, and one night he came and went during the night. Next morning, the last thing he said, no, he said that uh, during the night, was I conscious all the time? He said, oh, no, Dr. Ted said, you, you're conscious and you're unconscious. He said, you're passed out of my head. <laughs> She said, that's it. She said, yes, you did. She said, I know. What did I say? Did I say anything that you'd been your church to Christ? I didn't say anything wrong, well, did I make? And then I said, no, Dr. Taylor. She said, you preached the vow. And she said, this time, pastor, son, the vow. Then you won't pray for a while. And then you praise God for a while. And then you shouted for a while. And... He walked with me, and he talked with me, and he told me I am his own, and the joy he said, he said, no matter how good I am. Oh, you think it's not a to come to Christ? Not a Christ, too. I have any father.